Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Frosted Fur and Feet, the Fabulous Arctic Fox, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Rob. And I'm very excited to have everyone here. I haven't actually said that alliteration out loud myself yet. Frosted fur and feet, the fabulous Arctic fox. It's a bit of a, a furry mouthful in, in certainly some ways, but it was uh, it was fun to hear. And I'm finally excited to get to present this. So my name is Christina, as Rob mentioned, and I've been a, a now, expedition later here with NatHab since about 2018. And I realize that some people are turning it, tuning in for the first time, and some people have been following along um, over the years since we started the Daily Doses of Nature. And they bring me a large amount of joy. It's one of the days where I'm very grateful that this is what I get to do for work because it's a way to weave in stories that uh, that come across many paths and connect very different ways. So I hope you get a taste of some of that today. And I wanted to start off today with a quote uh, from a book by um, uh, Martin Wallen. And this is the sort of the theme that I want to run through your mind as we learn together today. So the fox's tendency to disrupt otherwise neat arrangements by its refusal to participate in a systematic account of nature, but also by an ancient tradition that considers the fox a wicked creature. The fox seems to be open for study as any animal, but is notorious for turning up where it's not expected or nor where it should be, and for changing its defining qualities to adapt and take advantage of different situations. And I realize that was a bit of a lot, but well, we're going to kind of break through just how exactly the fox fits into that, that perception or definition. And today I sort of brought up is going to be a little bit more of a storyteller's theme. And so I want to start off the story, I guess, where I first made a personal connection to Arctic foxes. And though this is a picture of one of the foxes I saw last season at, Pol at Polar Bear Season, and those tracks that you see behind it are actually uh, bear's tracks, and that's what the fox is, is sitting in when it was looking back on us from. Uh, my story with Arctic foxes starts probably about six years before this photo. And it was when I was a little lowly undergrad and I was doing a side research project on heart rates and basal metabolism. I was doing biology at the time and I came across this story and unfortunately I went looking for the original story and I couldn't find it. So for all you fact checkers out there, this might just have to be a story uh, or if anyone does know where the original one was, you should send it to me. But it was talking about old Arctic expeditions and it was the story of a ship being trapped in the sea and one of the crewmen had come across an Arctic fox and sort of captured it and tamed it and made it a pet. And so he was sort of giving up some of his food rations to feed this Arctic fox throughout the winter when the ship was trapped in the sea. Um, and one day the, the captain, or sorry, not the captain, the ship, the cook came to the captain and said, sir, we're running out of food rations. And the captain said, that can't be possible because we have more than enough food. We did the math. We were prepped and ready. We knew this was going to happen because that was a thing. It wasn't by surprise that these ships got stuck, sometimes in the beginning. But as more and more Arctic exploration went forward, this was a pretty common thing that they actually had to plan for. And so the cook explained that what was actually happening was that the rats that were on board were eating through their food reserves and they didn't have the ability to seal away food necessarily the way that we did. And that they were gonna end up starving if they couldn't get the rats under control. And the crewmen who, you know, as the crew was made aware of this dilemma, they tried to hunt the rats and trap them, but no matter what they could do, they couldn't get them. And so the crewmen who had this Arctic fox as a pet approached the captain with an idea. And somewhat reluctantly, the captain agreed. And the whole crew took all of their food, all of their supplies. They completely emptied out the ship, took everything out. And they set it all on the sea ice beside them and set up tents. And then they boarded up the ship. They, they essentially sealed it off completely. And they lived outside the crew for a week. But within that boarded up ship, they left the fox. And after about a week or 10 days, they unboarded. They they opened it up and inside they found the fattest fox that anyone had ever seen and every single rat on that ship was gone. And that was how the crew survived the winter, solely because of their fox friend. 
And so that story has always stuck with me for so many reasons. Um, one, I think because of the idea of, of the of the man taking the Arctic fox as a pet, but the idea that this fox that had never seen a ship or never done anything with a ship and a new prey, right? They don't have rats in the Arctic. They live off of lemmings and different marine food sources could all of a sudden master that in a short amount of time and get every single one is a pretty amazing feat when you think about it. So that was, I guess, my first connection. And the next one uh, wouldn't be until years later in 2018, actually. This was the winter, this was the spring before I ended up going to Churchill for the first time. I was at a winter festival in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which again is a very, very cold place. And let's see if this will work here. The fox that you see here was at the festival. Now, for those of you who are checking in, you might have some qualms about a wild animal being on a leash, and that's totally fair. I'll just explain the circumstances. This was a rescued fox um, that was being taken care of by one of the wilderness shelters just outside, and so it won't be reintroduced to the wild. It's now meant as a edu it's it lives with in the in the rescue center and is a part of education. But I was sort of fascinated by its little mannerisms and digging and playing in the snow, right? We were all outside there playing in the snow and so was the fox. So there's just a lot of connections, I think, that, that really stem from it. And so it's when a little creature like this looks at you, it's hard to not get uh, sort of entrapped in that gaze, right? And they're, they're pretty amazing, right? You know, we can talk about the basic biology of biological features of them. They're really quite small. They're anywhere from two to three feet long with about a foot of that being the length of their tail. They weigh anywhere from about five pounds up to 20 pounds. And they're just very small little creatures, but they survive in this huge massive expanse. And they're so well adapted that they're, they're pretty much masters of their environment. And I guess for me, beyond just their, their cuteness, the reason why I have so much sort of respect for them is because they survive in one of the harshest climates that we really know across the world. And I can't ever help it. I always have a soft spot for things that survive in unlikelihoods. It's like the, the tree on the edge of the cliff, the fox and the blizzard, they're the ones that make it through. And so uh, I always wanted to give a shout out to that. But they exist within a larger family, right? So there are, currently sort of 12 extant species of what we would put in the genus of foxes or vulpes. Vulpes, they have a funny name. It's a double one. And they also have lots of other cousins that are in the fox family. And so the journey of evolution that gets us from our general, let's say, red fox cousin to our arctic fox is a, is a bit of a cool one, actually. So when we look at their evolution. It's about three million years ago is when a lot of this branching happens. And for anyone who followed along with our bear evolution webinars that we did, I guess going on a couple weeks or maybe a month or so ago, this common ancestor that most carnivores share around 30 million years ago, right? So if you look on the on the branches coming out of this evolutionary tree, you can see the panda and the polar bear, right? Um, which they split off in a different line, but that canid line, like right, dogs, wolves, things like that, and into foxes, that they all form from that same arc. And so around 12 million years ago, the split happens between who would be the fox ancestor and who would be the dog ancestor. And then it's around 3 million years ago that foxes really start to diversify. And now this is, I think, maybe the one of the int more interesting theories in evolution. There's a, It's called out of Tibet. And so some people refer to the Tibetan plains as the third pole of the earth. So we have the North Pole and the South Pole. But the idea that this really high altitude area creates another Arctic ecosystem, right? You go higher up in elevation, you get those more colder, distinct climates. And so this idea isn't just applying to foxes. You know, they look at things like yaks and that sort of an adaptation to surviving in really cold weather and then how those species would have dispersed. So another thing that sort of to keep in mind, which I know this may be seen unrealistic, but is that the climate of our world has changed a lot several different times. And so what we would call Arctic conditions now once extended much, much further 
in different ice ages of the world further south. So that connection or that overlap isn't as unlikely as you might think of it now. So when you look at this map, those two red stars in the Tibetan plain represent some really cool fossils, which I'm going to show you in a second, that they were recently discovered. And then all of those yellow dots, so there's the yellow dots that you have sort of in the current Arctic. I think they got one up there. Excuse me. But those other yellow dots represent the other, other Arctic fox fossils that have been found over the last few million years, right? And so these would be sort of the furthest south ones for sure that have been found. And what's interesting is that they're not actually, those two red stars ones, they don't represent Arctic fox fossils necessarily, but they represent, uh, they found these teeth. The story goes that there was a paleontologist from the Museum of Los Angeles County, and they were hiking. His, his name was um, Xiaoming Wang, which I probably didn't say right, but I did my best. And story goes, they were on a hike and they found these teeth at about 4,000 meters elevation. And their pattern, their dentation, and the way that they're really more like scissors, which is a carnivore thing rather than like grinders, like you and I, what we have for our molars, the closest relative that they seem to have is to the Arctic fox. And so it has this suggestion that the ancestor of the Arctic fox probably evolved in that colder climate in the south and then migrated up moving north, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, but there's also a huge gap. So the interesting thing is that these teeth are dated to be about three to five million years older than any of those other yellow dots that I showed you. So it's a really cool theory. There's a little bit of skepticism because there's such a huge gap in whether or not this is it. Another thing, if you tuned in in our other evolution webinars, is that evolution is a really fun science to be a part of because ideas get turned to be wrong or right very often. How we date things, where fossils fit in, right? So right now, these are sort of some standalone samples. And as time goes by, we might discover more information that either confirms or denies this. But it's a really cool theory. And it's probably not impossible, right? It's just another potential story of the way that things came to be. But the take home is that foxes exist mostly circum, uh, circum what am I trying to say? Circumpolar is Arctic foxes, but around the world, all, there's different species all across the world. And they fill these amazing niches. And you'll find them in, you know, the, the stereotypical fox character exists in every ecosystem, but they're adapted and they match their ecosystem in these really fantastic ways. And so the Arctic fox does it, I would say, in quite a fabulous way, uh, which is a bit of a change up from some of its other, it breaks a lot of rules, I guess, it, uh, of what we think nature should and ought to do. The Arctic fox takes them and says, no, thank you. I will survive this my own way with my own path. This is the first rule that it breaks. It's called Bergman's rule. And as naturalists, we tend to think about things quite a lot of things are pretty simple, you know, uh, where the easiest answer is usually the most correct path going forward when you try and solve things. So Bergman's rule is based on the idea that the colder the environment you live in, the bigger you want to be to survive. And the logic of that has to do with surface area to volume. So it's this idea that the bigger you are, the more heat you can hold in your core and the more you can keep yourself warm, whereas the smaller you are, you actually have more exposed surface area. So the relative ratio means you have to heat more of your exterior, but you kind of have a smaller thermos or a smaller generator on the inside. It's a simple way to think about it. And I told you that Arctic foxes are obscenely small. So they break this rule. They, they choose to survive in the Arctic in another way. Another thing that they kind of deviate from is that a lot of other species that live in the Arctic, they do what they passively, uh, they use a passive strategy to get through the winter. So they either hibernate or they bulk up a bunch. So they put on a whole load of weight and then they use that to sort of survive through this starvation period because there's not a lot of food availability in the winter time. So I can tell you now that Arctic foxes don't hibernate and they're not like other animals where when fall comes they jack up their body weight get really chubby and then use that to sustain themselves throughout the winter they do have some weight fluctuations but it's not extreme it's uh, it's pretty mild and so this is it's the fact that they they don't do what everybody else does they found their own way they found their own answers you might say and as silly as this photo is this photo is actually the key to those answers so their survival strategy for energy conservation is mostly dedicated to their fur. 
They don't have the densest fur in the animal kingdom, but it's definitely up there. It's really, really thick uh, and extremely insulative to the point that their fur, their winter coat, can insulate them to the point of being 25 to 50 degrees warmer than their surroundings. And that ridiculous poofy tail that is hanging out on top of his body right now, which I said is about one third of their body length. So if, if little guy here was three feet long, his nose to um, legs would be about two feet and then that tail would be about a foot long is super important because that's it's like carrying around your own thermopad or your own thermorest. And they will sleep on top of their tail. They tuck their tail over their face to keep it warm. It's like having a big cushion to keep them warm in the snow, to, to keep them off of the ground, right? And that is really their, their key to success. They do it better than almost any other Arctic animal. And this is less cute, but this is what's happening. This is the heat part. So their fur is so thick around the core of their body that they essentially lose little to no heat from it. So what this is showing you is the picture on the pictures on the left are showing you if it's a dark spot, that's where they're losing heat from, or that's where they're more likely to lose heat from. And then the diagram on the right, all you really need to take note of is that if it's flat, they're not losing any heat. And then the higher up their body part is, that's where they're losing the most heat from. So if you look at that graph, the place that they actually lose the most heat from is their eyes. The only little spot, but it's a really small surface area. So you can see that it's kind of kind of worth it. But then obviously their ears and their nose and their paws, right? These are their vulnerable spots where they're losing heat to. And heat is the heat is the currency of the north. How you use, save, store energy and convert it into heat is how you survive. Which was leads us to their next really cool adaptation, which is countercurrent circulation. So the idea is that their veins, their arteries and their veins, right? So your blood leaving your heart and coming back to your heart, it conserves energy by being side by side as it goes to the extremities, so as it goes to the paws. So if you look at the top one, the top paw is an example without current, counter current circulation. So that means that warm blood goes to the paw, cools down, and then cold blood gets sent back to the surface. So for you and I, that's how our body works. Our arterial veins are really deep, Right. If you ever think about cuts or if anyone's a, a nurse or a first aid or anything like that, right, you, we worry a lot about arterial, the ones that are coming from the heart. And those are usually deeper cuts and that's going to pump out really heavy blood. But venous blood is coming back and it's a lower one. And so there's a layer to that in our system. So when we look at most of what we can see, if you look at your hand or your wrist, you're looking at your veins, your arteries are usually a little deeper. So if you're a fox on the other hand, yours are paired side by side when they go to your extremities. And the, if you look at the heat exchange, right, it makes a lot more sense because their, let's say their shoulder or, you know, up their, up their elbow is still around 30 degrees. But as they get closer and closer to their paw, their paw is getting cooler and cooler. But the actual difference in the heat in the blood is very, very similar between those arteries, the red, and the veins, the blue. Now, in this example of the picture, it's showing you that the paws are between 24 degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm going to tell you that the fox actually keeps its paws just above freezing. So we're talking, you know, at 32 Fahrenheit, so like probably not even 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Like it's two, three degrees Celsius is where they keep their paws. And then they warm their blood up up to like your and I's body temperature up to those mid 30s for by the time it gets back to their heart, which is amazing. Because if you and I, like if we were to get zero or two degree blood to our heart, our heart would sh be shocked and probably stop and we would die. So they have an amazing, amazing circulation. I hope you realize how cool I think that is because it's super impressive and I'm jealous of evolution and who got what. This is another rule. And admittedly, this one they don't break, this one they follow perfectly. So that's what's happening on the inside of their body to conserve heat. And then also the shape of their body, right? So it, they're small and everything about them is compact. So this is something called Allen's rule. And it's the idea that the warmer you live in, the more you want your blood to go into this big surface area so that it can cool down. So the fox and the rabbit or the hare that are on the left side would be examples of animals that live in the desert. They've got these big ears where they can get disperse a lot of heat. And then on the left side would be your Arctic hare and your Arctic fox, where they have small noses, small ears, which makes sense because the more blood that goes through there, the more heat you lose, but then also it keeps that tissue safer. I don't know if anyone who lives up north has had the unfortunate event of having your cat or your dog freeze their ears. It 
you always feel so bad for them, but they, they end up losing it to the point where um, the ear dies back to wherever the blood could make it to, right? And so over time, these have evolved just to be smaller to save them from that. So all the things I've been talking about have all been about heat, right? And I know it seems funny to focus on this, but it's heat and energy. That's, that's the most important thing in the Arctic. That's the take home. Got to keep holding on to that thought. So if you're going to survive in the Arctic, you have a few different strategies that you can go through to conserve your heat. You can, or should say to survive, to manage heat. Let's say it that way. You can increase your heat production, right? So you can just burn more energy, eat more marshmallows and give off more energy to keep you warm. You can reduce, reduce your thermal conductance. So that means like the fur, you can say, I'm not going to lose heat from my body. I'm going to be so well insulated like a Yeti cooler that I stay the temperature that I need to be and the rest of the world will change. And then also you can reduce the temperature gradient between the body and the environment. So you can actually lower your body temperature so that the gradient isn't so extreme, which is another amazing thing that box who can do. They actually lower their core temperature, which does two things. One, it lowers their metabolism a little bit so that they don't need quite as much energy. And two, it makes it so that that gradient isn't so extreme and so that they can actually power through um, really periods of without a lot of resources. Because right? every time they eat, then they can reset and then they have more energy, but their body needs to sort of feed it out accordingly. So, so far I've kind of, heat is related to metabolism and metabolism is, is related to how we regulate our body and everything like that. And so these next couple articles, I, I'm, I guess I'm bringing up because I'm admitting that it's like a loss of one of my favorite stories. So I mentioned that I was doing that study back when I was an undergrad or I was learning about Arctic foxes and I came across what's called lower critical temperature. So it doesn't matter who or what organism you are, your lower critical temperature is the temperature that you start to shiver at. It's the temperature that you go from your body's sort of side production of heat keeping you warm. So right now, just me moving, me talking, my metabolism, as I do those things, my body is creating energy as a side put of that reaction, the side effect of that reaction, sorry. Whereas if I'm cold, right, if I wasn't sitting in a nice climate controlled room right now that was at a comfortable degree, if I was cold, my body would start to do certain processes to create heat. So that's what we call the lower critical temperature. It's when your dial switches from I'm warm enough doing just being to I need to create heat because I'm cold, right? Now there was this old study from the 50s. That's what this old, this top paper was about. And it was saying that Arctic foxes didn't even shiver until it was minus 50, which I thought was so cool. There was this story about they had to like put them in a, they put them in a walk-in freezer in Alaska and they couldn't turn the freezer cold enough. So they sent it to Seattle and then they couldn't even get that freezer cold enough back in the day. And I always thought this was such a cool story. And then when I started digging into foxes, I had to be heart crushed and learned that one of my favorite science stories actually isn't true. So Arctic foxes, their lower critical temperature is minus seven degrees Celsius. So that would be, oh gosh, um, like 20s in Fahrenheit-ish. Apologies if that's not a perfect conversion. And so that's still really impressive, just to be clear. Like your hour uh, lower critical temperature, I think, is like high teens, low 20s, so like 70s in Fahrenheit. Like we're we're on a different spectrum. We start to get cold very easily, more or less. So minus seven is still really impressive in the animal kingdom, but it's not this crazy big number. And the reason why these studies are so different, it has to do with partially how we used to measure significance in the 1950s versus how we look at it now. But this is the real kicker. And this is the part I think is super cool, is that, remember when I said that their fur is so insulative that they can up the, it's like wearing a parka that makes sure that you're always 25 or 50 degrees warmer than the outside world. So here's the thing, if it's minus 40, or let's say it's minus 60, it's really, really cold, which is, or minus 50 is reasonably cold here. And, or I, no, sorry, let's stick with minus 40 because that's the same in Fahrenheit and Celsius. Let's stick with that logic. If it's minus 40, and they're wearing their fur slash parka that insulates them up to 50 degrees Celsius, it means that when they cover their face with their tail and they lay on it and they're all tucked in, even though it's minus 40 outside, by the time you get through that layer of fur and you get to their actual skin surface, it's only, if we take off the 50 degrees, it's only zero with their skin, 
which means that sitting in minus 50 outside or minus 40 outside, it's zero degrees at their skin, which is above their lower critical temperature. That's why they're still not shivering at that temperature, which is wild and crazy. That story that I told you about them having to find a cold enough freezer to make them shiver, they had to find a freezer, I think that was like minus 90 or minus 100 Celsius in order to get the fox to shiver. And that's why, it's because their fur is so insulative. It's so cool. So thank you for putting up with that. Oh, whoops, this is what I wanted. There's one more thing. And so if you, while I was telling that story, if you took the time to read what the title of the bottom paper here, it says seasonal variations in basal metab metabolic rate and lower critical temperature response to temporary starvation in the Arctic fox. Now, I said that they're really good at surviving in the winter time because they have all these things, but they still have to go through periods of fasting. And this is why I want to talk about this because I think that as humans, our physiological response to being hungry, we're very conscious of it. And the idea of actively starving any animal for the sake of science, I think can be really harsh in a lot of people's minds. But I think it's important to understand how body systems work. I don't, I'm not, I'm not condoning, you know, the, the starvation of animals, but I just wanted to roll through the science of it so that people can really understand what's happening. Because I think that places these actions and how we understand the world and how we understand their bodies in a better um, perspective. Because really we can only ever understand our personal experience, right? So it's hard to understand other things. So when we talk about fasting into starvation and, and curving into starvation, it's actually three different phases. And so, and, the, and our bodies go through this too. This is the exact thing that happens, but our bodies go through it in a much different way that's more drastic because we're not designed as an animal that's meant to fast. I mean, there's intermittent fasting other things, but not in the same ways that an arctic fox or a polar bear would fast. A polar bear can go months without eating. An arctic fox can go days to weeks, right, between meals. It's it's a much different thing. If you and I were to go to that long, our bodies would essentially start to dysregulate and we would, we would start to die. Their bodies are different, but the process is the same. They're just better at it. So phase one is we switch. Um, we, we don't have food coming in, and so our body starts to use up all of the sugar, all the glucose that's in our bloodstream. So that's phase one, and that's when we start to ration, um, that's when we stop like synthesizing proteins, and it's when we start saying, whoa, save all your proteins, we're going to need those, and start focusing, sh and we're going to start shifting gears into fat conservation. Now, the second one is when we switch into consuming fat. So then we start breaking down our fats, that's phase two, that's what... Um, those like ketone di uh, keto diets and things like that, so that's the focus on that, is that you switch over to breaking down your fats into your sugars for your body to consume, to keep your nervous system going, to keep functioning. And then phase three is when you've run out of, you don't have any available sugar in your blood, you no longer have sufficient fat stores to keep you going, and you start breaking down your own proteins. And that's the really dangerous and unhealthy one. That's essentially when the body is starting to degenerate and bad things are on the horizon. So that's the real pinch point, right? So those first two, animals flip, animals, you and I, we flip in and out of those things and they will do it over days or weeks, right? So an Arctic fox, that study, they had them, I think, for eight days going, which for you and I would be an obscenely long time, but their body was only just getting into the ketones by those days, right? They weren't starting to break down of that. So just keep that in mind, um, both to understand how amazing their body is and also just for some uh, perspective on, on the science. Okay, so I feel like we've talked about what their bodies are made of. Now let's talk about their behavioral adaptations. So the Arctic fox has one of the shortest lifespans, or I shouldn't say shortest lifespans. It has a very variable lifespan and it can be quite short. So the average lifespan of an Arctic fox in the wild is between three to four years. Now, that's the average. There are a few that have been documented to live 10 or 11 years, but the reality is that quite a few of them only live to be about a year. And they have this really harsh lifestyle, and that's why they have these high fluctuations, right? There's actually a really large number of, of foxes. There's around, um, it's sort of interesting because their, their population fluctuates so much that it's in this, 
we say several hundred thousand, it could be anywhere from 500,000 to a million, but we, we don't really know. And that's sort of the, the total population, but it also fluctuates a lot during time because their populations fluctuate with their main prey source, which are these adorable Arctic lemmings. So if you look at this graph, the, the, dot, the dashed lines, excuse me, are lemming populations. And then this is in Bilot Island and none of it and this is just an example of the, the bars are the populations of Arctic foxes following that. So they have this really variable life cycle where when their prey goes up, there's way more foxes. When their prey goes down, the foxes pass away. But the other thing, so lemmings are, always, let's say, their key food group for most of the populations. But they are an Arctic species and they live, if you look at the Arctic, and so this orange here is their habitat and where you can find them, that's a lot of coastline. That's a lot of water, right? And so you do get a divergence in how they live, right? You sort of get these, these different populations. And some of them are mostly reliant on lemmings, and some of them are reliant more on marine food sources. So whether that be birds or um, things that the tide will wash up, crustaceans that they can snag, things like that. And so you tend to get these, these populations mixed up and sort of smushed together. There's about eight subpopulations throughout the world um, and there's not a direct crossover between this but the those subpopulations tend to have more characteristically lemming based or more characteristically coastal based and with that there's also a color morphology that comes from it so if you are not someone who sees arctic foxes very often you might more be more familiar with the color morphs of red foxes so there's the typical red fox but then the other foxes that you see in that red fox are still genetically red foxes, but it's a silver fox or a gray fox or a cross fox, which has the two colors. And you'll see those both and they, they're sort of like redheads or things like that in humans, right? The same thing happens in Arctic foxes, but we call it a blue morphology. And I know they're not really blue, uh, but it's the same way that we would sort of say a blue roan horse. It's in that same caliber, caliber of uh, coloration. There are far more white variants than blue, and that's because most of the Arctic fox populations survive off of lemmings, but it's the some of the coastal ones that stick with those. They tend to be more of that darker hue, and that's because they blend in better with the, the coastal terrain, and that's where their prey is, so that's what the, the focus is on. And those that shift with the lemmings, they tend to go full white. Now, if you've also noticed, so I've been talking about white and blue, but then there's also a summer and a winter, right? If you look at the tops and the bottoms of these graphs. and so. Arctic foxes, like the Arctic hare, do do a um, coat change, and both colors do. So when we look at this here, I actually really love these time series because it's not very often that you get to sort of see the whole thing in flux. So this is showing how their fall color change would look. So the picture on the left is of white foxes who are going from their summer coat at 0% winter to 100%. And then there's the blue foxes on the right who are doing the same thing. And so they are not, you know, it's not nearly as distinctive without that sort of white and gray change, but they're, the consistency of their coat is changing, which is maybe what's more important for them. And then we can actually see the same thing in reverse come spring, right? So this is the spring mole. So this is, if it's, oh yeah, and this is labeled slightly differently. So if you look at the individual pictures of the foxes, it tells you whether it's a blue or if it's not labeled, it's a white, and then it's sort of about 95, and now we're working through a time sequence, right? So in the springtime, they're still mostly white, but their new coat is starting to grow in, and this is when they get that scruffy look, which is a big distinction between sort of the fall molt and the spring molt. The fall, they're just getting fuller, whereas the spring is when they tend to look a little more raggedy, and you also get that sort of uh, patchy different colors, which is coming in, which I think looks pretty cool, right? But again, we're seeing that down to 50%, down to 25%, and then we've essentially gone into full summer mode. And that's when they that's when the blues and the white color morphs tend to, to look the most similar. And we find most of those blues along Iceland uh, and then along Greenland. And then there's a few in, in Scandinavia. And those are also some of the ones that get farmed. So when we talk about Arctic fox farming, it tends to be um, that color morph that, that people are interested in. So, those fluctuations in their population, the way that they can sort of move 
so rapidly from season to season and year to year is because of their birth rates. So I said that we have lemming-based populations and coastal-based populations. Or if you remember it as white and blue, that works too as a rough approximation. And so what that means is that um, depending on which way they make their livelihood, let's say, that decides how big or small their litters are going to be. So Arctic foxes have the largest litter size out of any carnivore. They can have up to uh, 18 pups in a litter, or kits, sorry, because they're foxes. And so they're able to, um, what am I trying to say here? Sorry. They're able to, when there's not a lot of food, they actually, if they have that variable lemming source, that is when they have really large litter sizes. And it's almost, it's, we call it jackpot um, reproduction, which I know is sort of funny, but it's the idea that if you don't know your food source, it's better to bet big and bet high and hope that it works out because it'll be more variable. Whereas in places where they have a consistent, reliable food source, they have a smaller, more consistent number of pups because they know that those will survive. And so maybe it's, it's there's different ways to think about reproductive uh, reproductive success, right? Um, and so different animals find different solutions for them. And it's really cool seeing one population find two different solutions to, to achieving reproductive success. Now with those fluctuations, um, just because I said one was coastal or one was lending, it doesn't mean that they don't shift or move. And this next fox is probably one of the most famous ones. And so actually the, the pictures are different, but the story is of a young female. She was a blue Arctic fox. So again, just because they're coastal doesn't mean that they don't, uh, don't go voyaging out on the sea ice. And she traveled, so straight line, or sorry, total distance 3,506 kilometers. She went from Spitzenberg, which is in the Svalbard archipelago in Norway, to the high Arctic in Canada. So she did a straight line distance was about 1,700 kilometers, but that is a wild trip to make. That, and she did it in 76 days. So she left the Svalbard archipelago where she was born in March, and she arrived in the Canadian archipelago in Ellesmere Island in July, where she then set up, and actually after the tracking ended after that. So we don't know what happened here, but most likely that, were, that would be where she would settle and have her own pups and carry forward. So they are these amazing little creatures, right? I just got done explaining how small they are, how efficient they are, how they can go for fasting long periods. And she made that massive, massive trek. It's one of the longest recorded Arctic treks ever. And I wanna say that we wouldn't call this a migration, right? Because a migration implies a return. This is a dispersion. So they're born somewhere and they tend to migrate out from where, sorry, I did it, I did it right there. They tend to disperse out from where they're born. And even though her trip is arguably probably the most famous one because it's the longest, it's not unique. So this is a map of a bunch of foxes born in Bilot in Nunavut. And each one of those colors is a journey or a dispersion that they went, right? So this was study was looking at juveniles and at adults. And while more juveniles do disperse, it's sort of the young juveniles and some of the older adults will disperse because they're born in a really good pupping area but then competition means that they have to go outwards to keep looking for resources but just look at how wild and how far and unpredictable their dispersion was right it's something else to just take off into the unknown and not know what's going to be there and to figure out where to go so it's a it's a pretty amazing lifestyle that they have created for themselves so i feel like we've talked about their anatomy, we've talked about their lifestyle, but I would now like to take a little bit of time and devote some of our remaining time to talking about their personality and why the fox is, uh, is so famous just simply by being known as the fox. And it comes down to, it does come down to their personality, right? You know, if someone says there's a fox in the hen house, it has a literal meaning, but it also has an implication. If someone says that, you know, if they outfoxed you, there's all these connotations that we have that exist not just in the English language, but multiple languages, multiple cultures. Uh, and it comes down to their intelligence, right? So this, the, I know it's a little bit blurry, but you'll have to forgive it. It's a drawing from a 14th century manuscript of a fox pretending to be dead in order to catch a crow. 
And then the second one is from the 1960s and it's four photos of the same thing happening in Russia. And I can attest that we've seen the Arctic Fox do this with ravens in Churchill, Manitoba, when we've been on trip. And what they do is they will lay on the ground, sprawl out and be extremely still for sometimes hours. And you do think that they've died. They're extremely still. And these carrion birds will come in the hopes of trying to get a free meal. And after laying there for that long, just as the bird lands, the fox jumps up and tries to nab the raven. It's, it's really cool to get to see. Um, but you have to think about that. Like that's an animal who has planned, committed, and thought through essentially a trap, right? Which is a very complex hunting method when you really think about it. And so there's, there is this, this intelligence there that we've sort of admired and also um, been sort of fearful of through, through history. And, you know, that bias is it exists in our folk tales, it exists even in our science, uh, our natural history, our depiction of them. And in Christianity, there's a lot of different verses that associate sort of the fox with devilish behavior because of that cunningness. And it has to do with the idea of this intelligence sort of being amoral or socially amoral. And it goes against what we think ought to happen. And so they exist in this, in this gray zone. And it exists in multiple different cultures. Probably one of the most famous ones, um, at least in Asia or, or in Japan, comes to the nine-tailed fox. Uh, or they're known as shapeshifters, uh, kitsune. Sorry, again, apologies if I don't have the pronunciation quite right. Um, but they're an accepted figure in Shinto religion, and they can be for good or for evil. There's often stories of them shapeshifting back and forth between foxes and women, marrying men, sometimes with good in purposes, sometimes with not so good purposes. The most famous story might be of the jeweled maiden and the story is of a um, an emperor becomes infatuated with this woman of unknown origin and becomes her she becomes his constant companion and over time the emperor and his son start to get sick and one of the people in the court says that she has to leave and sends her away and then she reveals it and then she turns back into a fox and they chase her and then they they actually hunt her down and then she's killed and she's turned into a stone and the stone is this curse upon the land where anyone who comes near it um, will, will, is killed until later on someone comes and um, releases the angry spirit from the stone. And so there's sort of, I did a very short version of a very cool old story. So I apologize. You should go look into it yourself. It's a really great, really great folktale. Um, but there's multiple levels to that. So there's this idea of existing between two different worlds, of cunning and manipulation, and also the return to the earth, right? So foxes burrow down and she'll, she turns back into the stone. So she burrows back in and, and turns back into, uh, into sort of that spiritual realm from which she came. And so that's, there's a Japanese story. And that's sort of one for, let's say, ill, uh, or she had ill intent. But very similar stories exist in lots of different cultures. So in Inuit culture, there's a there's a story. Let's see, we'll try and remember this one as best I can. There's a man who lives in the village who will not take a wife. And everyone else in the village is very upset by this because often he comes home and his lamp is, uh, his lamp is not lit, his home is cold, things like that. And so, but he not, nevertheless won't take a wife, won't take a wife. And so what ends up happening is that he goes out hunting and he's been taking care of himself for years and years. But as he comes home over time, he sees a, a fox on the edge of the village. And every time he comes home from a hunting trip, he leaves a small bit of fish for the fox. And as time goes by, he does this time and time again over the course of months and into years. And then one day he comes back and at the usual spot to leave the piece of fish for the fox and the fox isn't there. And instead, when he comes home, he sees that his lamp is lit and that his, um, his tools have been sharpened and taken care of and there's a woman. And he never asked where she came from, and that, but they live together as, as husband and wife. And throughout that process, they're very happy and everything is going well. And then a stranger comes to the village and asks to spend time with his wife, which is a whole other Inuit culture thing about wife swapping, which is a really cool topic in and of itself, but it's a different culture, different time. I can explain that one 
maybe on a trip if you ever come with me. But, uh, and the man says, no, she's very jealous. Again, different relationships, but we'll just leave that aside for now. Uh, but eventually through their culture, the man persists. And when he asks to stay, the, the fox wife runs away and the man who she had lived with happily for years is then spends the rest of his life looking for her, right? So it's this interesting crossover, which there's a lot of duality that exists both within the fox and within these cultures and these stories. So they, the fox sort of in all of the different stories represents this in between, between sort of heaven and earth, between good and evil. They exist in this, this interesting plane um, and they, resent, they represent this otherness. So the, the nine tales actually have some significance in and of it themselves. And it's sort of this transcendence from, from earth into heaven. And uh, one of the stories is that the fox is in search of enlightenment over a thousand years. And for every level of enlightenment or closer to that it gets to reaching heaven, it adds on another tale. And so the ninth tale is, is reaching the, the highest level of enlightenment. And, you know, digging into old stories, I instantly realized that a lot of these things still exist in our culture today. We just don't even think about it or, or don't even realize it. So this is sort of a funny nod, uh, mostly maybe to my childhood or to my generation, depending on, on some of the people that you would have raised. But these are cartoons from my childhood. Tails is from Sonic the Hedgehog, if you ever played Sega, and the other ones are from Pokemon, um, right? But they, those representations of culture still exist in our stories today, uh, which, is, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And so these relics of how we understand the world, um, you know, sort of are sublimely in our culture in lots of different ways. If I jump back into the Chinese, or sorry, the Japanese example, which is the way that the Japanese answer the phone, which can sometimes be moshi moshi, which comes down to a couple different origins. One of them is that uh, foxes, as shapeshifters, they have a lot of vocalizations, but they're not able to make certain sounds. And so they're not able to actually make moshi moshi as a sound. And so they would say it on the phone when telephones were first invented in order to identify yourself as a human and not as a fox spirit. There's also an origin of this story that it had to do with uh, the way you would answer to someone of a higher rank is where moshi moshi comes from, but I like the fox version better. And so, you know, we, this, this amoralness of their intelligence that is what has sort of led to that duality. But the, the idea that the intelligence is there and the way that we appreciate it is seen in several different ways uh, through several different cultures, right? So this is a classic one from Aesop Fables, if anyone's familiar with those. And the leopard is sort of being um, a bit arrogant and comes to the fox and says, I have this, I have the best looking coat, you have nothing to match it. And the fox says, you know, your coat may be smart, but my wits are smarter still. And so this, this intelligence, that persona that exists in all these different cultures, it, it forms in different ways, right? So we talked about the, the relationships of um, sort of that good or evil or that drawn in of of them turning, of foxes turning into women, coming back and forth between the earth. But a really cool one, which I think a lot of, we tend to sort of overlook in some of our Western education is like different South American interpretations of a lot of these animals through through culture and through history. So the kachia, again, apologies on the uh, pronunciation for those out there, are some of the descendants from the Inca. And in their culture, the fox represents one of the major transitions between childhood and adulthood. So as a parent of a young child, it's your transition from being a child, raising your own children and entering the community as a full fledged member. And one of the things, um, one of sort of rites of passage was that different young men would have to go, they would often already be fathers or have young families, but they'd have to go spend time away and guard the farms and the fields from the foxes that would come. And so they would actually uh, end up hunting a fox and when wearing the skin and then use that to sort of defend the, they would be the fox that defended them against the other foxes and defended their resources. So at the end of the day, it's sort of this, this fluid transition, right? That's 
that's the key to their personality, their adaptability, where they fit in nature, where they fit in culture, is that they're very fluid. It's the reason why you can find them, whether they're Arctic foxes or other species, you find them all across the world because they're able to establish themselves in their surroundings. They have the curiosity and intelligence to engage with it and survive in a myriad of ways, which is, which is pretty amazing. And when we go back to sort of the cultural roots of that, a lot of it, you know, they talk about this idea of their knowledge coming from the earth. A lot of old folk stories say that the fox always knows. And the reason why it knows is because it's underground and it's connected. And it can hear things far away that are happening far away in the earth. Uh, so whether you believe that that's where the knowledge comes from, it's hard to say. But if we bring it up to sort of natural resource management into the present and into the future, the fox is very successful, specifically the red fox, right? Um, they are one of the few species that have an un, usually a paid and often open bounty on them in lots of different places because they're such a successful predator that sometimes has been introduced. Australia is a really sort of prime example. They were introduced for fox hunting in 1845 and have since been responsible for the extinction of 20 different native Australian species because they were so successful being brought in. And again, a quote from the Martin Wallen book, which is, in our time, the red fox has come to symbolize the destruction of indigenous diversity and the colonial spread of European and American monoculture. Consequently, even as a wild animal, the red fox remind us, reminds us we would, what we would like to forget, that humans entering nature tend to change it irrevocably. And so the red fox's status as a member of nature remains among the most ambivalent. And so, uh, you know, there, that push of these red foxes into places they haven't already been is also happening in the Arctic. And there's a lot of concern given that with that image that I just showed you of red foxes predating on Arctic foxes. And as climate change is happening and we're pushing that barrier north, what's that interaction and overlap gonna be like? And as a guide who's worked up there for the last five odd years, six years, I guess now, goodness. It's a question that we've actually talked about quite a bit. Uh, and in our own conversations as guides and people who live up there, we do see red foxes predating on them. And so we are really concerned about what that story and what that narrative is about to become for Arctic foxes. And so it's been interesting actually sort of diving into some of this and beyond direct predation, it doesn't seem that there's gonna be, at least in this moment and time frame, competition between them because they have enough uh, difference in resources that it, the studies have shown that the Fox, the red fox is unable to truly expand into the tundra. So at least that for the time being is still a safe zone for the Arctic fox because they're still relying on a mix between, uh, red foxes rely upon a mix of tundra species, boreal species and migratory species. Whereas at the end of the day, the Arctic fox can more or less subsist largely off of their tundra species and some of the migrating ones. And so, but the balance, that's sort of what the studies have shown, right? But as someone who's worked up there, you can sort of see that pressure gradient and it is building and it is building. So for now, it does seem that the Arctic fox is still able to sort of contend with it and survive, which is, which is good. But one of the big issues that is changing their story uh, rapidly is habitat fragmentation. So if you look at the picture on the left, that's a map again of their, the oranges, their habitat. And it's really this nice big circle that's all actually connected by sea ice, even though it's sort of blew it out in that picture. Historically, they, they've been able to make those huge voyages like I showed, and so their populations have been able to mix. But what's happening is that certainly the Scandinavian populations are becoming more and more segregated and unable to mix with the others because that sea ice isn't extending as far. And so evolutionary biologists, someone had fun inventing this term, they call it an extinction vortex. And it's this idea that something happens, there's a change or a catastrophe, which creates a small fragmented population. And then because of that, your population size goes down, the distribution goes down, and then your genetic malleability starts to change. So when they say an increase in genetic drift on the right-hand side, that means that uh, populations are becoming very, very different from one another, and that you have inbreeding starting to happen and that genetic diversity starts to go down in each of those populations. And that means that the adaptability goes down so that when the next change comes, they're not able to respond to it. And so you get this spiraling effect. And so 
while I said that there are still several hundred thousand Arctic foxes in the north, which is a which is great, they're often considered the least of concern. It's interesting to note that it isn't just numbers as a way to to manage or to understand population health, but it's actually the relationships between those populations have a lot of integrity that needs to be understood and and valued. So their story is changing, but I hope that you take away from this of all the things we've learned about the foxes that they are extremely adaptable and that I think that their world will change, but foxes are one of the things I think will will be there probably maybe long before us and potentially long after us. And I did want to end quickly with one quick story, which if anyone who read the description, I didn't know if they would actually put it in there, but this is the Arctic fox that stole uh, the moccasin from my house. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, I took the still frames from the video, but it is collared one, so this one was one of the ones that was, uh, but when I was up in Churchill, the, we left the moccasins on the step and uh, they came in and, and they snagged it. They did leave it eventually, uh, which I went and picked it up afterwards, but yes, this is the fox that almost ran away with my moccasin. So with that, I realize we're almost at the top of the hour, but just wanted to say thank you everyone and pass it back to you, Rob. All right, thank you. Now, before we get into the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, we do have a time for a few. So, um, do the do the kits nurse? It seems like eighteen kits would be really hard to nurse. Yeah, they do. Um, I will also say that the survival rate of the kits is pretty low. So, uh, they know like. 18 surviving to sort of that six month range would be pretty unlikely. But um, yeah, it, it, the competition for resources starts pretty much as soon as they're born. And some of the runs would be would be bumped out of that, unfortunately. So do the golden eye color of the fox, do they, does that serve a purpose? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. It yeah it has to do with they have different oh, i gotta remember how this goes we have brennan and cones they have a different distribution of of how they manage sort of light and dark and color vision the gold exactly i can't remember but the iridescence oh gosh i used to know this the whole idea of the animals when they had that nocturnal reflection uh it has to do with them being able to accumulate more light which makes sense both whether you're a red fox but specifically arctic foxes that are going to spend a lot of time up north right which is going to spend half the year in near darkness or complete darkness um so yeah that has to do with their ability to capture more light i'm sorry i can't remember the specifics so do the different fox species interbreed Ooh, that is a good question so arctic foxes and red foxes do not other species may i'm not super up to date on them it depends on how close genetically they are uh, and then whether their regions would overlap so some of them will some of them won't but i can tell you that the arctic fox and the red fox do not so do arctic foxes bury themselves in snow caves for warmth or to surprise prey yeah i didn't talk about that but yes yeah, so uh they will dig down to get out of a blizzard or to conserve heat that's another sort of behavioral adaptation they will, I haven't heard of them burying themselves to surprise prey. They kind of do the reverse when they're hunting actually. What they'll do is they'll hear the, the voles or the lemming underneath the snow and they'll track it from the surface and then they rise up on their hind legs and they actually puncture through with their front paws and dig down and, and grab them that way. So they do definitely hunt by surprise, but usually in the opposite direction. Rather than bursting out, they're jumping down. So do you know, do we know what the coldest temperature that a red fox can tolerate is? Ooh, I don't know their lower critical temperature or what they can tolerate. They they can survive in, I would say, nearly equally cold temperatures to the Arctic fox, but their body is not as efficient at it is kind of where the line is drawn. So an interesting thing that they've learned, well, that we've known for a long time because of hunting and trapping is that depending on where you catch a fox from will decide the degree or what we would say in, in trapping terms the, the quality of their coat but red foxes that are from up north that one that i picked showed, that was super fluffy like those are the really expensive ones that get sent off back when hudson bay was getting settled and all of this was a just basically a fur trapping area 
um, those are the ones they prize the most. That's how come they took so much effort to hunt way up north, even though it was way harder, was because of those coats. So they're able to adapt just as their populations move north to surviving in that colder weather, but they're not able to. I don't know. I don't know if their lower cold temperature would still be minus seven. It might be higher. So what that means is that they can survive in as cold a temperature, but it costs them a lot more energy. That's the thing to remember. So they'd have to consume more and change their behaviors in order to keep up with that level of cold. So is the gray fox another branch of, of uh, the Arctic fox or, or the red fox? Oh, okay. Uh, colloquial names are, or local names are such a different one. So there is a species of its own that's called a gray fox. And then sometimes people call the color morphs of a red fox, a gray fox. So I know that's a bit confusing, which is not a great answer. So if you look it up, but they, yeah, there, there's a separate species that are um, smaller. They live further south called gray, fo gray foxes, and you can find them sort of more continental. And then there's also a color morph that some people call silver, some people call grays, and that one's the same species. So it, I don't know which one you have in your mind right now, but they're, the answer, I guess, would be both, really. <laughs> So, uh, what are the main predators that do hunt the foxes for mm. the cold weather? Sorry, that hunt the foxes themselves or hunt yes. also hunt the same? Oh, okay. Um, honestly, they don't have a lot of predators. Arctic foxes, they're fast enough that polar bears don't bother with them. A wolf could outrun them, but it's not really worth it as a snack. So, unless they're sort of getting up in someone's business or essentially are weak or injured, nothing's really going to go after them too directly. Then, uh, but things like falcons, eagles, those will go for them. So when those are up there, like eagle, uh, different golden eagles have, their their migratory circuit will take them up to the tundra. So they'll, they'll go for foxes if they're out in the open. Um, but it's actually a short list. Their, their population is mostly sort of bottom-up control. It's their food availability that decides their abundance rather than predation upon them. Do we know why the Arctic fox disperses so far? Is it simply for food resources? I don't have an answer to that, and I don't know if the other side has to, but in simplest terms, yes, uh, but it's got to have to do, like, it's got to have to do with resource sparsity. So, um, and this is, again, a bit of a guess, so feel free to agree or disagree with me on this one. But when you think about the Arctic environment, it's really sparse. And so if where you are at, there's over competition or there's not enough resources, um, it's like a big desert. It's a big cold desert, right? So you have to go pretty far to find another oasis. And so I think over time, their evolution has learned to, to push to keep finding those, right? Like, um, you know, biodiversity hotspots in the Arctic are, are pretty small and rare. It is from spot to spot. So it is like traversing you, you know, you know that the next one isn't going to be till a long ways away. And so over time, the revolution has sort of has planned that in, that you go search far and wide. Um, I mean, also keep in mind that while I showed you dispersions that were really far, there's also some that don't go very far, right? There's some that will be born and die in the same 50, 100 kilometer radius because it's a really high productive zone. So both exist, right? Again, this is about their adaptability, their ability to change whatever, to match whatever their environment is sort of throwing at them. Is there a rabies issue in the fox communities? Yeah, so Arctic foxes and other foxes as well, but we'll just talk about Arctic foxes, are the predominant carrier of rabies in the Arctic. And now that you've had a sense of how far they can travel, you can see how easily it is for one subpopulation to potentially infect another. And so as climates warm and as those interactions with more Southern animals increases the introduction of rabies, their ability as a vector to carry it into other populations is really high. And so it's something that's being actively tracked. Wow, thanks for addressing that. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'm gonna throw it back to you for your closing comments. Thank you everyone for tuning in and talking about one of my absolute favorite little furred friends. I hope you all have the chance, if not to interact with an Arctic fox, but hopefully with a fox somewhere in your own ecosystem at home. 
Uh, there's nothing more amazing than settling in to watch a fox who you know is watching you. So something I hope for, for everyone out there, but regardless, uh, enjoy your day and I'll pass it back to you, Rob. Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.